I'm going to talk about uh, tonight is I'm, I'm going to use the, the, the crisis as the, the basis for kind of question, is this thing that we're supposed to be expert at, that somehow we seem to have managed to get into, into a big crisis again? And I, it kind of leads to some questions about what being professional in the strategic management of companies actually means. So what I'm going to try to get through is to talk to you very quickly about, about some common strategy mistakes that are made. I'll use one particular example to illustrate some of those right now and think about the value of the strategy tools that we currently use in relation to those mistakes. That will lead on to answering the question, why do we need something different? What, what is it? that we need, that we haven't got, uh, and what might it look like. I will try to fit in time to take you through a quick example of a, of a very simple project uh, using the approach, and then leave you with some next steps if any of you would like to learn more about, uh, about this. Okay, mistakes. This is a list of common mistakes that I was watching companies making between 2003, the end of the last recession, uh, and 2008. Not all companies made these mistakes. Some companies didn't make any of them, but these were pretty common. Uh, expanding too much, moving into what's called unprofitable growth, where sales is growing but profits are not. Too high pricing. You know, if, you can, if you've got very strong demand, it's always tempting to put, up the, uh, to put up the price. Diversifying into things that are actually outside your core business and uh, where you can't actually do very well borrowing too much to do all of those things, starting, quote, strategic initiatives, new kinds of business model, and uh, trying to do all of those things as well, acquiring too many companies and not giving time to integrate those and get all the benefits out of the acquisition. And all of this, you know, the big thing going on here as well is most of the companies I spoke to could not find the skilled people, both at an operational level and in a management level, to actually do all of this. In fact, I would go so far as to say most of the companies I was talking with between 2005 and 2007, finding more sales and more demand was not a problem. Finding people to actually build the business to serve that demand was a bigger problem. You know, you've heard of the phrase, the war for talent? They were in a war for talent. They were constantly struggling to, to expand because they didn't have the people to do it. Uh, and this is the one I really want to focus on. Why were they doing these things? What was it that they thought they were doing for investors by, by doing these things? Then, of course, we've got uh, the reversal itself. Obvious questions. Why didn't anyone see it coming? It had to come. It's happened before. Yeah, it's happened before. And why, not, why was nobody planning for that? Why are companies now struggling to work out what to do? And as I said, been here before. I'm old enough to remember you know, in 2001, 2002, the dot-com boom came to a horrible end. And in the technology sectors, we saw companies experience more than 50% loss of sales. You know, huge bankruptcies, laying off tens of thousands of people. And by the way, the consulting companies did the same thing. You know, they overexpanded, they overhired, they had to lay people off in 2001, 2002. And now we're in the downturn. We're, we've got a new kind of catalogue of mistakes. This idea of across the board cuts. Oh, we've got to cut all of our budgets by 20%. Why? Why should we cut 20% off marketing and 20% off uh, R&D and 20% off the travel budget or whatever? Yeah. What I've seen is a lot of, kind of gesture management, you know, d doing things because you have to be seen to be doing things. Yeah. We're going to stop all travel. Why? Is that a good thing? You know, if you're, this executive could go over here and make you a million dollars, you're going to not allow them to get on that plane. Why? No hiring. Oh, we're going to have a hiring freeze. Remember, you know, 
It's only about a year ago we were struggling to find the people we needed, and now we're going to have a hiring freeze. Cut the consulting budget, throw the consultants out. An American company I was uh, doing some work with six months ago had an, a, a consulting budget of $300 million a year to spend on McKinsey and ECG. They just cut the whole lot overnight. It didn't matter if projects were in the middle of doing something. They just cut the whole lot. And then we've got price cuts. Cutting out layers of management. Oh, we've got to be seen to be reducing our cost and lowering our overheads. But we didn't have enough people, and now we're going to get rid of the people we've got. And when, pe when people go, they take capability with them. These are the people who know how the business works. And you're going to throw them out of the door. Bad, bad idea in most of the cases I see. In crisis, in real crisis, if you are about to go bankrupt, then maybe you've got no choice but to do that. But most companies are not in that situation. Failure to focus, so we're going to cut everything even though we've got activities that we should never have started. And uh, then they've been reading the management journals who say, oh, you know, in this crisis, you really need to fundamentally redesign your business model. No, your business model was fine. Right? You may have overextended it, you may have overcomplicated it, but your basic business model worked. If it didn't, you wouldn't have been successful in the first place. Maybe there are some things to do about you know, massaging or changing the marketing channels you use or something, but not a fundamental redesign of your, of your business. And again, we're not managing investor expectations. We're not telling in, in, investors the realities of what we're up to. This is not what you should expect if strategic management was being professionally done. As I say, it's not universal, but it's, it's far too common. So I'm going to take you through a, a little example to set this up. And I've chosen this one, first of all, because it's a very well-known example. Secondly, there are case studies about it that have been taught in business schools for many years. And thirdly, because they've just arrived in South America, right? <laughs> um, I see that they've got uh, 10 stores in Buenos Aires, and Leonardo was telling me they've uh, opened stores here in the, in the home of coffee. I mean, how dare they? <laughs> right. uh, so, anyway, uh, here we go. This is their expansion between 2002 and 2006. They've been opening up to 2,000 stores a year. That's 40 stores a week. A little bit of a, of a reduction in the expansion rate in 2008. Uh, we'll explore that in a, in a moment. Revenues, you know, very strong growth. What's that from uh, three and a bit up to ten and a bit? That's three, you know, nearly nearly four times growth in just uh, just six years. And this is their profits, their operating profit, rising from what's that about three hundred million up to one point one billion. And then in the latest year, uh, they reported a halving of that profit. But this much of it, about 300 million, uh, are exceptional costs to do with restructuring to try to keep the, 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 the basic profits at a, at a high level. So they're spending lots of money on that. I'd like you to notice this. Operating margins back in 2002, 9.5%. Every dollar you spend on coffee in their stores, operating profits of 9.5 cents. By 2006, that was up to 11.5%. These are very, very good operating margins in a low unit cost retail operation. Very good margins indeed. We'll come back to that. How did they become so successful? Well, a apart from their wonderful coffee, all the case studies on the, on the company's early history talk about this. Fast food industry, typically, staff satisfaction levels 50%, 60%. People don't like working in these places, typically. Turnover, up to 300% a year. That, the average staff person in fast food stays in the job for four months. I suppose it could get worse than that, but the worst among major changes is that kind of number. So you need people productive really fast. Starbucks reversed this idea completely and said... We're going to put huge effort into staff retention and staff satisfaction. 
because we think that's important to keeping hold of customers and getting them to spend, the company was spending more on employee training and development than they spent on marketing, which is remarkable. That's very unusual. The result, staff satisfaction over 80%. They were rated the second best place to work in the United States. And turnover rates way below industry average. Now, what's that worth? Well, here's an example. They employ 170,000 people with 80% turnover. That means having to hire and train 130,000 people a year. If their turnover was 200%, not, not even 300, if it was 200%, that would mean hiring and training 340,000 people a year, a third of a million people. Right? That is just, the, the numbers don't bear believing, do they? It's incredible. Uh, and that's on top of having to find 30,000 extra people for the stores you're opening. Why was that really useful? Well, their 2008 revenue was $10.4 billion, and regular customers visit the stores up to once a day, basically, once per working day. If they only visited two and a half times a week, let's say, then revenues would have been only $5.7 million. But if you only had, what's that, about 60% of the turnover then most of those stores would not have been viable in the first place. You wouldn't have been able to open them. You couldn't justify them. So you wouldn't have had even $5 billion in revenue. You wouldn't have had $200 million in profits, let alone uh, a billion. So this, this is fundamental to, to how successful they, they've been. What's happened in the latest year? Well, as I uh, showed you, revenue is up again. But... Weakness in comparable store sales. That's stores that were open in the previous year. Okay? What are the sales this year in stores that were open last year? Down 5% in the United States. So where did the growth come from? Sao Paulo. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and Buenos Aires and London and, uh, and Athens. That's where it came not, not completely. Um, there's some expansion of, of stores in, in North America as well. Operating income down to 504. Margin, remember that 11.5% number I told you? Margin was down to 49 But if you take out all of the exceptional costs with the restructuring, it was down to 81 So the underlying profitability down from 11.5% to 8.1%. And what have they done? In the last quarter, when, when the, the trouble was really beginning to, to show up, uh, well, they cut their general and administrative costs, otherwise known as overhead. It had been 5.1% in the fourth quarter of 2007, and they've improved that to only 3.8%. And where did they take, where did they make those improvements? The favorability was mainly due to payroll related expenses. By the way, you might find it interesting to uh, go and have a look at a website and a discussion forum. If you look up Starbucks Gossip on Google, you will find the site. Uh, and it's a great kind of continuous discussion between staff and store managers and uh, customers about what life is really like in, in Starbucks. Uh, there's some very angry people out there right now. But, uh, not, not everywhere, and, and a lot of people are still very loyal, both as customers and employees, but this is, this is really hurting uh, people. And what's going on here then? Well, you don't get two percentage points of extra margin in this kind of retailing without really being quite aggressive on, on pricing. Uh, so you don't necessarily put up the prices of a product, but what you do is you introduce new higher priced products. I've been in this kind of retailing. I, I know these tricks. <laughs> uh, you introduce new higher priced products and you take away the lower price, uh, price one, ones. Um, and they added 500 stores more than they should have done. How do I know they added 500 stores more than they should have done? Because last year they closed 500 stores. <laughs> yeah. Now, should they have been anticipating this? Well, yes, they should, because in 2002, 
the returning CEO at McDonald's came into uh, the job and said, the first thing we are going to do is we are going to cut back uh, on the over-expansion of our store network. He said, we've been spending our time adding stores to customers. We're now going to switch to adding customers to stores. So McDonald's did exactly the same, made exactly the same mistake and had to make exactly the same response in 2002. How did they not know that? How did they not know that? And th if, if the store costs a million dollars, I'm told it's about that. I, I probably should have researched it uh, properly. But if it costs a million dollars, that's $500 million of shareholder wealth that has just been put down the toilet. Oh, plus the cost of actually doing the, the closure as well. So shareholders made these extra amounts of money during these years, but then they've had to throw away uh, $500 million. And uh, during that time, accepting uh, pressure from investors and analysts for, for unsustainable performance. Who told them they had to deliver 11.5% margin? If this number here um, had been, instead of 1.1 billion, had been 0.9 billion, would there have been a shareholder revolt saying, this is unacceptable performance, the board should be fired, the chief executive should be shown the door? No. No way. Why did they do that? It wasn't necessary. They earned their bonus. They earned their bonus. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah quite possibly. Quite possibly. Yeah, yeah. I, I couldn't, couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so uh, here we go with the downturn itself, and now we're starting the, the store closures, and now we're spending another $300 million of shareholder funds sorting out the trouble, uh, and we're cutting those staff-related costs. And again, they're accepting uh, pressure from investors to make them do that. Why did they feel they had to take out 1.3 percentage points of cost? Only because they presumably thought that these people wanted them to do it. And by the way, I don't, think, I don't think it's the investors. I think it's these people. It's the analysts. It's the people writing the reports every quarter, making critical and over-demanding uh, expectations on the management of public companies. And this is a, a little slightly shocking thing here. Most analysts now go through a professional program with something called the Chartered Financial Analysts Institute. This institute has 100,000 qualified members worldwide. It currently has uh, 180,000 people going through that three-year qualification program. And I have been through the curriculum of that program. And nowhere in that program is there any requirement for analysts to have any understanding of the connection between strategy and performance. How on earth can anyone write any kind of critical comment about a firm, a public company's performance without even the basics of how strategic management and the choices that management make actually comes through to the performance of the organization? I think, that's, I think that's pretty disgraceful, actually. But, hey, that's their, that's their profession. That's the way they want to run it. So, so now we're left with this problem. You know, where's performance going if we go on like this? And how are we going to turn this around and bring about some slightly more preferable uh, outcome from where we would otherwise uh, end up going? Okay. These things come up all the time. I just picked this up from the newspaper last Friday. This is a chart from the report in The Economist. This is the rate at which shipping has been completed, the construction completion rate for ships. And you can see that uh, you know, we've had a, a bit of a boom here in the, in the early 70s and then uh, uh, gradually, and look, huge escalation in the number of ships coming out of the shipyards. And where is most of that shipping today? It's sitting on the sea, outside the harbors of this world, waiting for something to do. Literally waiting for something to do. In fact, I, I understand that the Chinese government are getting quite cross about all this shipping just sitting there outside their harbors. But, of, of course, there's more to come. <laughs> there's another 50% to come. 
another 50% completion rate. So the, the question I've got is, who ordered that ship? Who ordered that one, right? The last one. It couldn't possibly have made sense to place that order. So uh, why, why did that happen? What were they thinking, the people who, who placed those orders? Now, I've, I've worked in cyclical industries. I worked in uh, petrochemicals, which is a notoriously cyclical uh, industry. And, um, you know, I know the, the kinds of things that happen, the pressures that build up. And here's why, here's why this happened. Right? In 2003, to use one of the main classes of ships, you would have had to pay $15,000 a day. At the peak last year, you would have had to pay $300,000 a day. Now, if you're running ships and you're renting them out at $300,000 a day, what are you going to do? Let's have some more. Give me more ships. Give me more ships. Unfortunately, the result is that, that one of those vessels uh, reported in this article is, is to be sold for less than half of what it costs to, to build, or it's going to be scrapped. Uh, but the, the, the question that, that really should be on someone's mind is, why, why did we not see this coming? We've been here before. We've been here before. So, you know, somebody should have known. Someone should have been asking the question. One of the best pieces of advice I ever got when I started working on strategy, when I was putting together strategic plans for, for businesses, was um, you know, just check through that plan and ask yourself the question, what's the worst that could happen? What's the worst that could happen? If your plans are okay when the worst happens, then it's probably all right. Carry, carry on and, and go for the, the upside view. If they're not okay when the worst happens, rethink your plans. And that surely is just the basic responsibility of, of strategic management, of top management of companies. They should, they should always be asking that question. What's the worst that could happen? Their job is to protect it's to protect the organization and its future performance. Uh, and that's what they've been letting us down on most recently. So we've got problems. We've clearly got problems. How much use and value are the strategy tools we have for those problems? Now, please don't misunderstand me. I am not saying that the strategy tools we have are of no use. I'm saying they are of limited use. And we need to understand those limits. Okay. So these, would, would these uh, phrases be familiar to, to pretty well everyone in the audience? Five forces, you know, how industry forces determine profitability levels. Uh, the value curve, you know, what value proposition uh, means to people. Understanding and analyzing resources and capabilities. They're, they're fine. They're, they're, they're very good. But what they do is they answer this question about how to position a company to be more profitable than others. What we clearly seem to need is we need something to tell us how to manage strategy as it progresses over time. Continuously. This, this is something that happens every week, every month, every quarter. And we've got to do it across all the functions. We need to make decisions on product development and marketing and sales and uh, logistics and staffing that are consistent with each other and support each other. And, sorry for those of you who don't, don't like maths, these are quantitative questions. It wasn't whatever that number was on the, on the shipping fleet. It, it wasn't uh, some abstract notion of Ugh, too many ships. It was a certain quantity of too much tonnage that was uh, constructed there. How do these tools work that we've got? Well, basically, the, the established tools start from an industry-based perspective. Let's understand those competitive conditions in the industry and use those to identify a place where we can be more profitable. And uh, then we can work out what resources and capabilities we need to develop in order to, to exploit that opportunity. It's kind of outside in. Let's look at the outside world and work out what we need to do in, inside to, to exploit it. What I'm arguing for, I think, is a more firm-centered, a more organization-centered uh, view. Lay out how the business system actually works, how it makes money. Then move on and put it against competitors to see how we perform better than a competitor. 
And then we can start looking at these external changes. You know, what if market growth uh, changed from 5% to minus 10%? Right? Uh, but it's all done on the basis that you understand how the basic business system works. It's an inside-out uh, view. And there's a, an additional benefit, uh, which is that that makes this approach equally applicable to public services, to uh, voluntary organizations, and other non-profit enterprises. This being based on kind of microeconomic understanding of competitive commercial markets, quite difficult to get insights for those organizations out of that. Not impossible, but it's, it's difficult. So we end up asking different questions. In the industry-based case, you start asking yourself, how do we get a position where we can make better profitability ratios than other firms in the industry. So in Starbucks' case, you know, how can we achieve margins of 9.5% or 11.5% when other people are only making 6 or 7 or 8? In contrast, we're asking this question, how do we drive sustained profit growth? So in Starbucks' case, that would be how can Starbucks deliver sustained profit growth of, uh, let's say, 15% uh, per year? and not fall by too much when times get difficult. Uh, strictly speaking, we should be doing this on the basis of free cash flow, not, not uh, profits. That's, that's the number that gets reflected in the value that investors place on, on the firm. And that's been axiomatic. That's been fundamental to the way the finance community understand performance and investor value for, well, since I did my MBA, and that's a long time ago, right? Uh, 30 years. So <laughs> they've known it for that long, uh, at least that long. And in fact, we, we've known that profitability, superior profitability, is not particularly interesting and not particularly sustainable since uh, a book by Edith Penrose in 1957. So we've known this is not the right question to ask for a long time. And that, that's the question to, to be asking. Okay, let's switch to a different case now because I want to look at this issue of strategic positioning. This is a value curve a diagram of Southwest Airlines, one of the first low-cost airline businesses ever, ever formed in the 1970s in the United States when the, when the government deregulated the industry. And basically what it does is it says, what are the things that might be of value to customers? Price, meals, lounges, choice of business class, connecting to other flights, friendly service, speed, and so on. And how do, uh, how do alternative services compare on those dimensions? So what they've done here is they've said, here's a traditional airline, you know, high-ish price, not very good meals, but you get meals, uh, lounges, and um, business class if you want it, and the ability to connect to other flights. Uh, not very good service uh, and not particularly far. So if you want to travel from city A to city B, um, you could choose that or you could drive in your car. Uh, and if you go in your car, it, it's very much cheaper and you don't get any of these things, uh, but you get to, to travel whenever you want to. So what does a low-cost airline do? Well, it says we're going to have a price which is very comparable to the cost of driving yourself between cities. That's assuming it's not across water, right? We're not going to bother with, uh, with meals. We're not going to give you lounges. We're not going to give you business class. We're not going to give you connections to other flights. But we're going to give you great service very quickly and lots of flights so you can travel pretty much when you want to. This is an example of a value curve analysis for one particular kind of company. And it's not wrong. It is definitely not wrong. It is true. And it's quite useful. Yeah? It's true and it's useful. But it hasn't changed in over 30 years. You could have drawn that picture in 1975. It wouldn't have been any significant difference today. This is a useful tool for, uh, for identifying places in which you can make more money than, than otherwise. Uh, but it hasn't changed in 30 years, and it's been copied by dozens of other companies. Yeah, they're everywhere, aren't they? They're everywhere. Not as successfully as this company, as it happens, but we'll, we'll come back to that. 
you know, there is one, one framework. Uh, this is Michael Porter's activity system for Southwest Airlines, and it's got essentially the same things on it. Limited service, very low prices, frequent departures. It's basically the, the same things, showing that they're related to each other. And again, it's not untrue. It is quite useful. But again, it hasn't changed in 30 years, and it's been copied by many, many competitors. And if you did a value chain comparison between this company and regular airlines, you'd find something similar. But here's the question for me. If that's all there is to strategy, what has the strategic managers of, of this business been doing for the last 30 years? Presumably, they could have written this down and handed it over and then retired. That's all you needed to do, if, that's, if this is the answer. Well, Herb Kelleher did not retire. He ran that business for over 20 years very, very successfully. So he must have been doing something during those 20 years. Uh, just note that he was given the Lifetime Achievement Award for uh, outstanding strategic management by the International Strategic Management Society in 2003. And I can still remember his acceptance speech. He said, thank you very much for this award, but I don't know what strategy is. Yeah. Um, uh, I just did what seemed to make sense, and I've uh, been trying to make good decisions ever since. So, Let's ask this other question. If, if it's more than positioning, what is the more that it is? You know, if, if strategic management means more than just positioning. Uh, this is a European version of this company. If anything, even more successful than Southwest Airlines. I think it either is or is about to become the largest world airline in terms of number of passengers carried. Not, not number of miles, but uh, kilometers, but in terms of sheer passenger volume. Uh, this is their profit in 2006, and, and this tiny little chart here is a chart of their profits every year since 95, and a little line there going up to a plausible objective they might have for, for 2011. Maybe they're, they're trying to hit profits of 980. I don't know. And their chairman hasn't shared with me what his objectives are, but it could be that. In order to do that, they have to achieve something else. They have to carry more passengers. They carried 34.8 million in 2006. Maybe they've got an objective to carry 57 million by 2011. Yeah, who knows? What needs to happen for this outcome to, to be delivered? Well, let's go through this basic question. What causes profit? What causes profit? This is their profit and loss account. And all we're doing is we're kind of spreading it out with causal connections here. Profit is revenue minus costs. Revenue is what you get from fares plus what you get from selling other things like meals on the planes. Costs come from operating aircraft, routes, airports, staff, and marketing and other spending. Um, so that, that's their profit and loss account. Right. I'm not doing anything magical or mystical here. This is just basic arithmetic. Or let's just do that and now do it over time. Well, there's their profits over time. There's their revenue and costs over time. Those are, their, those are charts of their actual numbers. And we could expand those charts and they would give you the detail of each year. That revenue has come from fares and ancillary uh, products. Where do fares come from? Now, here's where we start taking a different path. If you read the, uh, the, the finance reference books that the consultants uh, use, when they get to the point of saying, if you're going to do a profit forecast for a company, you need to forecast their revenues, how do they recommend that you do that? They recommend that you find a forecast for market growth, forecast or set targets for market share, and multiply those two together. Market size multiplied by market share equals sales, right? It's arithmetically true, but it's not causally true. We get revenue from sales multiplied by price. This is transactions. 34.8 million transactions at a price of 41.2 euros. That's the causal explanation for that number. So it could have been different. It could have been 25 million journeys at a fare of 60, but it wasn't. Right? It, was, it was those two numbers. So if we're going to deliver 
that profit, the 980, and we want that revenue, that's going to come from that number of passengers. You remember the 57 million? That's a fare of about 41 euros. That's one way that, that you could get there. So now what we want to know is where do passenger journeys come from? They do not come from market size multiplied by market share. They come from people who choose to fly with you. So what we want to know is how many people fly with us. Customers and journeys are not the same thing. Uh, we don't know if it was 7 million people flying five times a year or 35 million people flying one time a year. Right? Those are not the same. But this multiplied by that is that number. Um, and they don't tell us what this number is. They may not even know, actually. It's quite possible. Uh, not that easy, actually. Surprisingly, for an airline to know how many actual people they sell to. Uh, so here's the logic. We want to explain the performance outcome, work back through the financial factors, uh, through the non-financial factors, and sooner or later we get to these things. This thing in a box is called a resource for reasons that I will explain in a moment. It's something you have to collect and hold on to. That's a, a resource. And, and we'll want to know what causes that number. We can do exactly the same on the cost side. Aircraft costs are not explained by revenue multiplied by the fraction of spent on aircraft. It is explained by how many aircraft you've got. <laughs> if I had twice as many aircraft and everything else was the same, including their utilization, then my cost would be twice as much. Same on routes, airports, and stuff. Yep. The number of routes explains the costs I incur operating routes. There are also costs associated with getting these resources. It costs you money to open a route and to hire staff. And some costs are simply direct decisions of management. Yep. We decide how much to spend on marketing. Right, what are these resource things? Why did I put them in those boxes? Why weren't they just some, you know, another number or another chart? Well, they, they have a very particular characteristic. And it's an arithmetical characteristic. What these things do is they fill up and drain away. And we know how to deal with these things. That's what cash does. This is the cash in your bank account. If you had $1,000 and you paid in 500 and took out 450, you will end up with 1,050. Precisely, to the penny. Now, what explains this? Well, the cash in comes from your salary plus your investment income. and Your cash out comes from your, your rent and what you spend on food and so on. Now, this, this principle is called asset stock accumulation. It is deeply fundamental to the way the world works. There is no escaping it. It is simply how it happens. This number is not explained by, by that number. If I were to take a uh, survey of this room, I would find a very poor statistical relationship between that number and this one. I would find a mathematically identical relationship between this number and these two. This number is precisely the sum of every cent you ever paid in minus every cent you ever took out. That's not a theory. It's not an opinion. It is simply the way the world works. It is axiomatic. It is mathematical identity. If these things are so fundamental, surely we need to deal with them wherever they arise. And where do they arise? They arise with anything that accumulates. And customers accumulate. The customers I have today is the sum of all the people who ever decided to become my customer minus the sum of all those people who ever decided to stop being my customer. That's not an approximation. That is arithmetically true. Slightly worryingly, many companies don't know what those numbers are. They know what that one is. They know what the difference between those two is. If this company had won 2.57 million customers and lost 1.74 million, you'd still have this number here. But it would be very different, wouldn't it? You'd be losing, uh, what's that, 20%. This is only losing 10%. So all I've done here is I've stuck this on the front of the other bit that we had. And why do I need to do that? Because if I want to deliver these outcomes for profit, revenue, passenger journeys, 
in 2011, all of the things back here, our decisions have to make these things happen so that those things happen over there. This is where management controls the system, and that's where the performance comes out. Uh, it's not technically difficult. It's not mathematically difficult. It's just a different way of understanding how things work. And if we put it all together, I'm simplifying and I'm putting in the, the costly resources as well, we end up with one of these pictures, a staff, aircraft, routes, airports, customers there, and all of these, all of these links, but they're, they're not simply saying these things have got something roughly to do with each other. They're saying, if I know this number, I can estimate or calculate that one. They are arithmetically causal relationships. And back here, everything in green is what management controls. So you can see, there you are, there are all the levers that management controls here. As I say, you know, they're a long way away from the performance outcome. So this, this bit on the left, this is the machine. This is the machine that functions, that works, and delivers those outcomes on the right. That's, that's what that picture uh, means. Um, and there's an important thing, which is that you know, these flow rates also depend on other things that you've already got. So if I've got too few aircraft relative to the number of routes, my aircraft utilization is very high, which means that my customers experience delays, which means that some of these customers will leave. The fraction of customers who leave will be higher if there are delays, which arises from too high aircraft utilization. And, and that's what very clever companies like Southwest and Ryanair are very good at managing. They're very good at managing those balances. And for those of you who are uh, kind of concerned about the theoretical side of, um, of business, just a reassurance here that, that underneath this is rock-solid theory. This is deep, rock-solid, universal theory. You know, this, this is the holy grail of, uh, of research in, in the social sciences. Yeah. And you know, I'm, not, I'm not taking any credit for this at all. A guy called Jay Forrester found this out in uh, MIT in the 1950s and 60s. And all it says is performance depends on, performance at this moment depends on what resources I've got, management decisions and some external factors. Resources accumulate. Resources I've got today is what I had yesterday plus or minus what I've ever added minus, minus lost. And this rate at which resources are won or lost depends on what I've already got and on some management decisions and some external factors. Um, so, you know, pretty much that's how any uh, organizational system works, those three equations. You have to extend them to deal with competitive rivalry and to deal with intangibles like uh, capabilities, but you know, they are simple extensions of, of those basic formulas. That, that works. If these business things are quite complicated, and if they, we don't quite understand how they perform over time because there's so much going on, what do we do in any other field? Well, we use simulations, right? Why don't we do the same with business? So let, let me just show you a quick picture of a, a simulation here. This is the, the same thing we just looked at. Here's the company's profit, revenue, passenger journeys, journey frequency per person, uh, customer base, uh, fair. Okay, so let's run that with the assumptions that we've got in. Okay. With this assumption for journey frequency and this assumption for fares and the assumption that customer churn is no more than 10%, our customer base grows to 11 million. These numbers are slightly different from earlier. Uh, we carry nearly 60 million journeys, and we make 1.1 billion. So we would want to know, you know, what if some of our assumptions aren't right here? Well, let's change some of those assumptions. Let's say, you know, we're not sure that we can, we can keep customer churn as low as 10%. What if that were to rise to 15%? Well, because this loss rate is now higher, we don't fill up the, the tank of customers quite so much, so our revenue 
is lower, and it's quite a serious reduction in our, in our profit. And uh, I suppose the other thing we should do is ask ourselves, well, you know, what if there were a downturn? Yeah. What if there were um, you know, an economic downturn? It could happen. In 2006, it could happen. Let's see what, what the effect of that might be. Well, maybe instead of people flying increasingly often, they actually start flying less often because they can't afford it. But let's see what that does to our, to our performance. Well, uh, you see, you know, our revenue is going to stall and our profits are going to be killed. Uh, and that's how much they're going to be killed by. Now, from there, you can go on and ask other questions. If we're flying fewer passenger journeys, then we don't need the same number of planes. So how many planes do we need? Now, that would reduce the penalty up here. Maybe we shouldn't open so many routes. Maybe we should uh, slow down the rate at which we uh, open new routes in just the same way as Starbucks slow down the rate at which they open stores. Oh, so except that they didn't, did they? No, they kept opening stores. Okay, do you, you see the idea? This is just, I mean, you could do this in Excel. There, there's nothing fundamental here that you couldn't do in Excel. You just wouldn't want to, right? Why would you want to do it in a, a large sheet of boxes and, and, and rows when you can actually do it visually in, in front of you like this? It's just a much easier way of understanding how things work. That would be a professional way of thinking about strategy and performance and, and working it out amongst the management team. Now, we've also got to think about how do we train future professionals. Well, how do you train future professionals in other fields that are dynamically complicated, where you've got complicated things happening? Well, I, I guess some of you have flown in aeroplanes. I guess you were pretty trusting that the, uh, the man or woman flying the plane had done it before. And... Did you ever think to yourself, I wonder if this is the first time they've done it? I wonder if it's the first time. Because there must have been a first time, mustn't there? <laughs> there must have been a first time. Do, do you think when, when they did fly that plane for the first time, that was all the practice they'd ever had? <laughs> no, no, no. The first time they flew the plane was in a simulator and the second time, and the fifth time, and the tenth time, and the twentieth, and probably the fiftieth time. They only took real metal off the ground for the first time after they'd practiced on a simulator lots and lots of times. Why don't we do the same with management? Isn't that how we should train people to understand how to fly our companies? This is a really simple simulator of, of an airline, of, of an airline rather like Southwest or uh, Ryanair. And just as you would with uh, an aircraft pilot, uh, what we can do with these is we can put people into a situation. So you can say, your left engine has just stopped. Get out of that. Well, here we can say to people, your cash flow has just gone horribly negative. Get out of that. What are you going to do to get out of that situation? Um, and this is one of uh, uh, an infinite number of scenarios we can create in this very simplified model of, uh, of an airline. Don't let me overplay this. This is grossly simplified relative to a real business in a way that an aircraft simulator isn't. An aircraft simulator really behaves like the real aircraft does. But then that's because it's, it's mechanistically possible to program that. You can't quite do that with business. But it's, pretty, it's a pretty good start. So what we do is we, uh, we develop these things and uh, students get to play at running this company. And they get to have to balance growing the fleet and increasing the routes and worrying about the, the routes that they share with competitors. These are routes you operate on your own and these are routes where other competitors are trying to take your, your business uh, from you. And uh, you know, can you get cash flow positive and then build sustainable cash flow uh, out of that? Not can you deliver 9.5% operating margin ratio, right? Can you grow cash flow? And so as in many professions, practicing with models is the way people learn. Uh, they don't learn 
by practicing on uh, real people for the first time. Yeah. Um, when you talk about pilots, they are human beings as our customers. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, journalists always ask it, why uh, you your company do this this kind of strategy or, mm. or do another strategy? Mm. Uh, well, I, I think I think the answer to that is is something similar to the the way in which other professions work. You know, when, when, when you have a finance director responsible for the financial well-being of your, of your business, you expect them to follow well-known procedures, uh, well-established procedures that make sure that your company is in financial good health. And if they mess that up, yeah, they pay the price. Well, they should, should pay the price. Yeah. Uh, um, we don't have those procedures for strategic management. No one has codified those things. There should be a procedure, for example, that says when you're expanding your business, evaluate the declining quality of that business as it, as it progresses. And if you reach a point where winning another customer means winning another unprofitable customer, you should stop. So uh, your journalist should be saying to the CEO of Starbucks, why did you open 500 stores too many when you already knew in 2002 that McDonald's had made that mistake? You know, we, sh we should have these basic disciplines and procedures about doing things professionally and doing them uh, reliably. Okay, this is an example of a, a rather small, simple project that we did using this approach. It concerns a medical product. It's a, a device that uh, people need to carry with them if they suffer from a particular serious condition. There's about 400,000 of these people. They usually discover that they have this condition because they get very ill. Uh, they can get so ill that they get taken to hospital. It can be, it can be fatal. Once it's known that they've got this complaint, they have to carry this thing with them. The problem that, for this company is that this product is going off patent in 2010. They will lose all their sales. They have a new product. For various reasons, it can't share the same brand name, and they have to launch and replace that, and they can't start marketing it more than 12 months before the old one expires. Got the idea? You know, product, going to die. We've got to replace it uh, very fast. So here's, the, here's our architecture. We call these things architectures. These 400,000 people don't all know that they've got the complaint. We've got 300,000 who don't know, 100,000 who do, and this is what's going to happen to sales. We get some sales from the people who first come onto the uh, odds using the product, but we get a, a replacement rate. The product lasts about a year before it needs replacing. So, what do we want to have happen? Well, these yellow pumps We've got to drive these pumps so these people get pumped into using the new product and anyone new gets pumped into using the new product as well rather than either moving to a, gener a cheap generic substitute or a competing product. All right? Those are two other places these people could go that we don't want them to go. So there's that same picture. Uh, how do these pumps get driven? They get driven by doctors who either put new patients on there or encourage them to replace their, their, the product. Currently, the doctors are all down here recommending the old product. There's 10,000 of them. We've got to make them aware of the new product and then convert them to recommending the, the new product. And we, if we work really hard, we think we can move 200 per month from here to here. Remember me saying strategy is about numbers? That's the number. This is the number of doctors. That's how fast we've got to move them. Now, how do these doctors come to be aware and committed to this? Well, they, they typically follow the recommendations of key opinion leaders, and there's only 20 of them, 20 real experts who know how this disease works and know how best to treat it. So we want to get them aware of the new product and committed to the new product. What are our levers on this? You know, here's, here's the machine. What levers have we got that are connected to anything? Well, we've got marketing spend and we've got a sales force. So how much of each and what should we do with it? 
Well, because these patients, the, the company, when we started talking to them, thought that they should put a lot of effort into a, a website for people with this complaint to go to to find out about the complaint, to find out about the new product. Unfortunately, this complaint causes trouble so very rarely, most of these people will never have a second attack. So they are not the kind of people who are constantly on the web looking for solutions to their medical problem. They are not the kind of people who join patient support groups because it's very unlikely that it will ever happen to them again. So this, this arrow basically uh, is not connected. It doesn't connect to anything. So that doesn't work. We can spend money marketing to doctors, but again, this is a rare thing for doctors to have to worry about. So doctors are not going to notice this marketing. It would be very expensive relative to your potential sales to do that. We've got, I think we've got about seven salespeople. Should they go and see the specialists or should they go and see the doctors? Well, it kind of looks obvious they should go and see the specialists. But even if they do, the frequency with which doctors find out about recommendations from these people is actually quite very rare. So, you know, they don't bump into these people in the street or, or, you know, or at conferences. It kind of doesn't happen. So it kind of looks like our levers are not connected to anything. What, what, what do we find? That link doesn't work. That link doesn't work. This link doesn't work because doctors don't really want to hear from salespeople about a problem they don't ever have to encounter. So we seem to be stuck until we say, well, is there some way we can make this machine work? Well, yes, there is. These doctors have to regularly update themselves on medical issues generally, and they go on training events, general training events, on which there might be four or five topics discussed, you know, diabetes, uh, heart complaints, uh, obesity, whatever it may be. And we, what we could do is we could get just a very small place in one of these training events with these experts saying to doctors, I won't take much of your time. I know this is only a small part of what you do, but just be aware that this old product is kind of coming to the end of its life. It's a much better new one, and you should try that. Uh, thank you. Goodbye. And soon after that, then a sales call goes to those same doctors, because you know who goes to the, to the training events. Now, if you do that, then you can hit this 200 number. Otherwise, you can't hit it. This 200 number means, uh, from memory, I think, about 20% of sales calls are effective. If you don't do that, less than 5% of sales calls are effective. That's their current effectiveness. So there's a summary of the, of the uh, findings. Here's an important point here. Yeah? If we do this training and we do a blitz of 50 salespeople, not five, not seven, 50, right, then we can make that pump run that fast. But this is going to cost five times more than the currently planned strategy. Not 10% more, not 20% more, five times. And that's a big, big change of mind for a board to, to make. If you do, then this is what can happen to the sales rate. This sales rate here, after about four years, might be back to 2007 levels. But this sales uh, rate here is actually enough to pay for that extra effort. One year payback from this decision. And because the new product is more profitable, we actually get back our profit levels inside three years, and then we start making more money uh, than we would have done from the old product. So there we go. A quick summary. Poor strategic management is very common. And I suppose I should say it's not their fault. If the professional training doesn't provide you with the tools to do a better job, it's hardly your fault that you don't do a better job, is it? Uh, I think we bear the blame for this, not them. And, of course, there are fantastically well-run companies out there. there yeah. Absolutely brilliant. I love them to bits, but far too many uh, poor ones. Current strategy tools are okay as far as they go, but they don't go very far because they ask the wrong question, yeah. improving profit ratios rather than driving profit growth. They focus on that 
question of positioning rather than management. And strategic management is a continuous process. It is not a once a year or once a decade party. What I've outlined here is just one solution to this. I, there might be others. I haven't seen anything that I think solves this problem. It's a very different way of looking at things, but it's not technically difficult. It's not time consuming. The medical product project we did took three weeks with a team of uh, three people. So we have the slight advantage that this company was very well informed about its situation. And quite often we, we work with companies who are not well informed. A friend of mine who uses this, this approach with consumer goods products like Coca-Cola, SAB Miller, in most companies he works with, he typically finds that that crucial data on the flow rates, remember the flow rates? How quickly are customers being won? How quickly are they being lost? Where are they being won from? Where are they being lost to? And why? Those are the fundamental questions. In most cases, he has to initiate basic uh, new research and to find that data. But the, the prize for doing this well is worth, worth millions and billions. And many problems actually can't be solved any other way. If your problem is dynamic, in other words, how is performance changing over time, if you haven't got a dynamic tool for answering that question, you're never going to find the answer. But when I talk to companies and put up that simple stock and flow about customers, customers won and customers lost, they say, well, that's obvious. Okay, it's obvious. Tell me what the numbers are. Well, I don't know. It's only obvious if you ask the question, right? It's not, not obvious if you don't ask the, uh, ask the question. It's like these the little kind of Christmas uh, puzzles that you get in crackers, isn't it? You know, when someone shows you how to get these two bits of bendy metal to come apart, you say, well, that's obvious. <laughs> but only after you've spent three hours trying to work it out for yourself. And lastly, you know, the good news here is that, is that there's huge opportunity. The difference between good strategy and poor strategy is immense. And it may mean doing things very differently. The example I showed you involved committing five times more. Very often we discover that you can do something five times less. Uh, and it will be just as uh, effective as doing what, what you're doing. So, again, my friend in fast-moving consumer goods usually ends up cutting his client's marketing budget. Not, not increasing it, cutting it. Because he's actually moving you know, all this money, right, that much of it is wasted. This much needs to be focused, so we can save all that, and we just need this little bit extra. Who was it said? Um, I know half of my advertising budget is wasted. I just don't know which half. Yeah. So, well, that's why. That's why he doesn't know which half. If you want to know more about this, uh, basically just go to strategydynamics.com. There's lots of stuff there. We do a fortnightly email. Uh, it's just an auto, auto email, so you don't have to. You, you're very welcome to buy the 670-page book, um, and I'd be delighted if you would. But uh, if that's a bit too much for you to read over the weekend, this fortnightly email may, may get you started. We do an online course with special co uh, terms for in instructors. So I think that's, uh, that's it. If I've got any time left before the football, there's uh, any questions? Yeah. Right. You're, you're dead right. And I, I should say that there is one big danger with this, and that is when you draw that diagram, you effectively lock up your view of how the thing works. Right? You lock it up. You freeze it. That's how the system works, and we're going to optimize it. Right? This, this question, how might a potential new business or a potential different business work, is what you need to do before that. You need to, and you need other tools for that. Um, uh, the value curve, for example, is a, a, great, a great tool for, for doing that. Um, I, I was actually um, in charge of strategy for a business which went through one of those kinds of transformations. What I would say, though, is that transformation on that scale is very unusual. Very, very unusual. Okay, Nokia, the company I worked for, there's a handful of examples. It's very unusual. Most companies who feature on our list of, of fantastic companies, if you look at them, the basic business model has remained unchanged for decades. Exactly. But
But what they have done is they've extended it and pushed it into new areas, for which you, we also need to do what you're suggesting. We need to add the creativity to say, here's how our business model works. Let's see if we can add something. What might that something be that we're going to add? So yeah, you're dead right. We, you need that extra piece as well. How can we uh, adapt and move our business model forward? Uh, and then you use this to test it in software before you test it out in the real world with real shareholders' money and with other people's careers. We're not just risking shareholder value here. We're risking people's personal well-being. Uh, and that makes, that's another reason I get very angry about this. Yeah. this. This crisis we're in is hurting millions of people a lot. And uh, somebody is, has been substantially negligent in inflicting this pain on people. Uh, it's not acceptable. It's just not acceptable in what should be a professional job. Sorry, uh, you've got me going. <laughs> There's a big field in scenario planning, which is um, looking at plausible different stories about how the future could develop. It, it emerged most strongly in Shell in the 1970s, I think. Um, and it, effectively, the question you, you're, you're asking yourself is, let's, let's extend the system outside the boundaries of the company. Let's extend it to include changes in the demand environment, changes in suppliers, political changes that might impact on our world. And I'm actually just starting a, a study on this uh, right now where um, an organization wants to plot out plausible stories for how their environment might change and use that to design their strategy so that it is safe under that range of, of scenarios. Uh, scenarios is is not a case of a, of a, a good forecast or a bad forecast. It's alternative views of how the world could develop. Uh, but you, use, you can use exactly the same principles because, as I said, the way the world works is fundamentally made up of these accumulating stocks. You know, the number of terrorists in active uh, uh, engagement today is the sum of everybody who decided to become a terrorist minus everybody who decided to stop being a terrorist or got killed. Right? That's, that's that stock. And what we want to know is what's driving the flow rate into the stock of people who are terrorists and what's, the, what's driving the flow rate of people who are leaving. Look at the, uh, at the building boom and bust in, in Dubai. I, I just can't believe that no one saw that coming. Uh, I've been predicting it for, for four years now. I can't imagine why anyone is building new real estate in Dubai. It's already too much. Yeah. Supply and demand are going to cross. So. Uh, does that answer the, the, the question? Yeah. You can explore the, the futures that way. We can, draw, we can draw those pictures of a scenario of the world. Uh, well, well any, any organization of any size needs to understand how the people flows are working through, through their system. Let me give you an example of, of, uh, of just how badly wrong uh, you can get it. In 2005, Shell made an announcement that it was going to hire a 1,000 experienced petroleum engineers. Why did it need to do that? Because it had got in trouble with the Securities and Exchange Commission for misstating its oil reserves. Now, that, a little bit of that was a, finan a financial reporting problem, but a big bit of it was that they didn't have enough skilled petroleum engineers to do the evaluations properly. They needed a 1,000 more experienced petroleum engineers. Does that sound to you a lot or few? Or a lot. The United States graduates 300 petroleum engineers each year. So in one year... In, in one go, they wanted to hire three times the annual output of the entire uh, U.S. university system uh, in petroleum engineering. Now, why have they got themselves in that position? Well, what do you mean by an experienced petroleum engineer? Uh, do you mean someone who graduated two years ago or three years ago or five years ago? Do you mean someone who graduated ten years ago or fifteen years ago? 
So here we are in 2005, needing 1,000 people we have not got. When did we fail to hire them? 1990, 90, particularly the 91, 92 period. What happened to the oil price in the early 1990s? It went down. What happens to oil company profits when the oil price falls? They fall. What do oil companies do if their profits fall in an attempt to keep it, keep it up? They cut back on their people and their hiring. Right? So uh, Shell, along with all the other oil companies, by the way, cut back their hiring in 91, 2, 3. And now, in 2005, they haven't got the people who they should have hired in uh, 91, 92, uh, 93. Um, so that's how you should be connecting your staffing strategy uh, through to your, your operating performance and through to your financial performance. Well, well staffing is part of the model. Um, I only showed there a single stock of staff. You, know, you either had um, staff flying your planes or serving your coffee, or you didn't. Um, in management ranks, you have to segment that by the different kinds of staff you need, and you need to, to work the pipeline. You need to know what the pipeline looks like across all of those functions. And that gets complicated. Um, shortly after the, the Shell situation, uh, BP appointed someone to a senior HR position uh, because he was an engineer. Engineers know how to do this. Right? We, we've known for a long time that engineers will ultimately rule the world. It's just a question of when. Right? Uh, so we have the audience, and we have to thank you, Professor Moore. Pleasure. Pleasure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Wonderful. Thank you.